this meeting will be uh, recorded. I also remind all the participants to post their questions on the community of practice. The link is or will be posted in the chat group. The first presenter we have today uh, is uh, Beatrice. Beatrice uh, is um, from Kenya. She's a data manager and information systems specialist and has several years of working as uh, a software developer implementation implementer of free and open source information systems, especially in the HIV and RMNCH space. Uh, Beatrice, please. Thank you very much, Mahima. And thank you very much, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, Mahima has uh, indicated, my name is Beatrice Zakeo, a data manager at uh, FHI 360 Afio Zazi. I'm happy to present to you today on the topic of how we are using DHIS2 Android app for rapid result initiative information gathering for monitoring to increase port ANC, skill bath attendance, and PNC attendance. Okay, so we'll go today through the topic. So I'll give you a little introduction about Akio Zazi. I'll give a background, our objectives, this, our system architecture, the methods we use, our results, conclusions, and recommendations. So Akio Zazi project is a USID funded five year project uh, that will be operational from October 2016 to September 2021. It's a consortium of two organizations, that is FHI 360 and Gold Star Kenya. The project aims to increase family planning, uh, reproductive maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health impact by increasing access to and demand for these healthcare services in the project coverage area. So we operate in uh, two uh, uh, major regions in Kenya, that is uh, Baringo County and Nakuru County. So for in Nakuru County, we operate in two sub-counties uh, called Kuresoe North and Kuresoe South. And in Baringo County, we operate in four sub-counties called Baringo Central, Baringo North, Marigat, and Mogotio. So I'll give a little background of how we came about adopting the DHIS2 data capture app system for data collection. So through the implementation of our project, uh, we noted that in, in our operational regions, uh, most of the pregnant women are uh, attending first and C visits very well. However, they're still finding it a challenge to complete four ANC visits, to deliver at a health facility by a skilled birth attendant, and to access uh, postnatal care services within three days following a delivery. And uh, we can see there that in 2018, um, only 49% of the pregnant women uh, nationwide completed four ANC visits. Only 65 had a delivery at a health facility by skill that attendant, and 21% accessed PNC within three days after delivery. So in Kuresoe North and Kuresoe South, only 22% of the pregnant women completed four ANC visits, and only 41% of uh, the mothers uh, delivered at a health facility by skill that attendant. 43% accessed PNC services within three days after delivery. So, so these um, indicators were, were low and we wanted to find a way that we can be able to improve these indicators in uh, our operational areas, that is Kuresoe North and Kuresoe South. So that prompted us to, to partner with the Department of uh, Nakuru County to implement a rapid result initiative which we call SAGE, so that we can be able to improve the health outcomes of the mothers in Kuresoe North and Kuresoe South sub-counties. So uh, because it, is, it was an RRI, we needed to have uh, data more frequently than what our national system was providing, because our national system was providing data on a monthly basis, but we wanted to have data on a weekly basis, so that we can be able to use it for implementation, progress monitoring, and also for decision making. So we adopted the use of DHIS2 Data Capture, which is a mobile-based application for weekly data submission by the healthcare workers. So our objective was to provide timely data using the DHIS2 Data Capture app for collaborative review and decision making. 
So this is the architecture of our, uh, our system. Uh, it involves the use of uh, mobile phones, which we provide to the healthcare workers. So the mobile phones are Android based and they're installed with the DHIS2 data capture application, which the healthcare workers use to submit data over the internet. So the data they are submitting is just the number of pregnant women they are seeing at their health facilities who are attending first NC visits, who are completing four NC visits, delivering at the facility, and those who are um, uh, accessing PNC services within three days after delivery. So this data is transmitted over the internet to a central server which is hosting a DHIS2 uh, system. Uh, the data that is collected here is uh, used to generate Excel-based uh, dashboards, which is disseminated through WhatsApp groups and also used during project technical review meetings and quarterly advisory review meetings with the regional teams. So the WhatsApp groups we created uh, were, consist of uh, regional health management teams and project technical teams and also the healthcare workers. So these are the methods we went through to accomplish this implementation. First of all, we started orientation and sensitization meetings with the Nakuru County Department of Health where we selected 15 health facilities in Kuresoi South and 14 health facilities in Kuresoi North that were contributing 80% of indicator performance. That is for NC1, NC4, SBA, and PNC. And then we developed a health facility micro plans for each of the facilities based on the service delivery uh, challenges that each facility was, was facing. And then we designed paper-based data collection tools that now could be used by the health facility to, to submit data on a weekly basis. After that, we went into the system development phase where we developed DHIS2 data sets from the paper-based forms that we designed in the orientation set phase. We customized the DHIS2 data sets for mobile data collection using the DHIS2 data capture app and then we created WhatsApp groups for each of the sub-counties, which consisted of the county health management team, sub-county health management team, healthcare workers, and the project technical teams. We moved then uh, to the rollout phase. In the rollout phase, we procured smartphones, SIM cards, and data bundles uh, to be used by the healthcare workers. We trained 29 healthcare workers from the selected 29 health facilities during the orientation stage on how to use the DHIS2 data capture app for weekly data submission. And then we provided, we provided each facility with a smartphone that they could use to submit data. So from there, we went into a dashboard generation and dissemination phase. So here we designed Excel-based graphs and pivot tables for implementation progress reviews. And we disseminated the dashboards through WhatsApp groups and also used them in technical review meetings on a weekly basis. And then during quarterly advisory meetings with Nakuru Department of Health, we also used the, the dashboards. So what uh, our results are, we have uh, noted a couple of things using this uh, DHIS2 data capture system. What we've noted is that we've been able to receive data on a timely basis for decision making. We've been able to identify service delivery and uptake challenges in a timely manner and provide resolutions. And we've also been able to design other interventions uh, other, and also to identify intervention implementation gaps to, to increase impact of interventions to increase maternal and newborn health service uptake. So because of this, we've been able to note significant increases in uh, the number of, uh, uh, in the maternal and newborn health service uptake. So if we compare the period when we did not have this implementation, that is October 2018 to January 2019, and the period when we had this implementation, that is October 2019 to January 2020, we noticed significant increase in the number of pregnant women completing four NC visits, which increased from 1,440 to 1,998. 
Those delivering at our health facility increased from 2,399 to 2,815. And infants receiving postnatal care within two to three days of delivery increased from 2,314 to 2,871. So our conclusion is that through the use of DHIS2 mobile app, we were able to enhance efficiencies in data collection, which led to more frequent access to data for rapid feedback and assistance. And we are re recommending that the departments of health for counties should adopt these strategies so that they can enhance efficiencies in data collection, timely reporting and decision making so that they can improve uh, for the NC visits, delivery, and SDA, access to PLC health service centers. So these are the authors of the abstract, and uh, that is Beatrice Zakeo from Mafia Uzazi. Maureen Chebe is a reproductive health coordinator at Kurosuino. Asila Kimanzi is a USID AOR. Eric Odipo is from Afro Zazi program, and Bernard Yauchi is from Afro Zazi program. So thank you very much. Uh, that is all I had for today, and um, I hand it back over to you, Mahima. Hello, Mahima. I've handed Very it much. back. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was not able to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, okay. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, this was really interesting, and especially because you have managed to uh, work across the continuum from uh, antenatal care through birth, care at birth through postnatal care. It was very interesting. Please remember to post your questions. I've posted one question. We can come back to that if we have time uh, at the end of this session. Uh, the next presenter will be Brian O'Donnell. He's a senior implementation advisor at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, um, facilitates e-registries development or tracker data collection at an individual level. And um, Brian is a colleague. We work together on the development and implementation of maternal and child health in uh, Palestine and Bangladesh as well. He also works with the University of Oslo to configure standardized DHIS2 uh, metadata packages that follow the WHO guidelines. Over to you, Brian. Um, thanks a lot, Mahima. It's a real pleasure to be here and join us. A fantastic discussion today. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about how we have analyzed data from DHIS2 for uh, RMNCH, um, but going about it in a slightly different way. Uh, I will share how we can use some passively generated data from DHIS2 tracker to analyze some patterns of client movement within the maternal care system in Matla, Bangladesh, and then also explore some possibilities for how we can better communicate and visualize these data most, effect most effectively. Um, so to start, I'm going to give some background on the context of this case study uh, and then share some methods that we've used for data extraction analysis. Uh, then we will get into some preliminary results of this analysis and I hope to encourage a discussion about how we can better leverage uh, data on the location of different events within DHIS2 uh, to uh, uh, share different analyses for other health areas and contexts. So to start with, this work is a part of a uh, very large, uh, one small part of a very large RCT in Matla, Bangladesh, um, on the effectiveness of Tracker as a pregnancy registration system to support clinical quality improvement interventions. So there are a number of interesting features of this system. Um, those of you who have been to conferences before may have heard of new registries model. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all of them. Um, including feedback dashboards to care providers and SMS to clients. But what's really important is uh, for our discussion today is two key features of the system, which is first here that um, it's a shared register across the community and facility-based cadres of health workers. The Bangladesh MCH system is really complex 
and there are four different cadres in two different directorates under the MOH um, that provide services to pregnant women. At the community level, FWAs visit women um, of childbearing age in the community to offer family planning and counseling, while health assistants have uh, satellite po health posts to provide immunization. Uh, but all clients can access other services at community centers and family welfare centers. Um, and in the e-registry, client records could be shared by all maternal uh, care cadres in the public health system. And we hope that this really improves efficiency and quality of care. Uh, secondly, uh, this, pro this project included a system to uh, use biometric identification of clients. Uh, it was called the ePalm app. Here you can see a um, representation of it. Um, it was developed by Element Inc. And it greatly improved the identification workflows and really minimized duplication within this uh, e-registry system. I think uh, within the first guess of um, uh, taking a picture of a palm, it was about 85% uh, matching. And then over three times, it was 99% in our, uh, in our tests of this tool. Um, so the system is really designed to approach the goal of many tracker systems, which is uh, one record per client. Um, and so because it's capturing all the different public health services that are provided to pregnant women, and there's very little duplication um, at the community and facility levels, this really allows us to understand more about how a uh, individual pregnant woman moves through the public health care system in this one context. Um, but we run into a bit of a, a problem here, which is that there are no metrics within DHIS2 to do that multidimensional analysis. So we need to get data out of DHIS2, and I can share a bit with you about how we perform that analysis. But here we have some of our, uh, our shortly our, our priors about how we would expect uh, patients to move through the system. Um, probably the, um, the family welfare assistants would register the pregnancies first and then send them to the facilities, um, and then there's limited movement between the other cadres. Um, so we extracted these data from a, a SQL view on ANC events um, by the different TI, included some information on the, uh, the stage, the event organization unit, the gestational age of that event, um, as well as the or enrollment organization unit as well. Um, and then, you know, we could extract some other data through the API just to um, get a better sense of uh, contextual analysis. And then uh, we loaded all these data into R to, to process them and come up with different ways that we might be able to explore them. So in a very basic uh, representation would be a histogram of uh, event counts by the organization unit type. And you can see that um, most of the uh, pregnancy identification at the unit level uh, took place around 10 to 12 weeks gestation, while others peaked around uh, 20 to 23 weeks. Um, so there's a link to the code here as well, to where we explore a bit more of the different visuals. Um, and at the end of this, I want to talk a little bit more from my like, CHI through analytics perspective about how we want to represent these, uh, these movement data through different uh, visualization channels. So getting into the literature of, uh, of uh, visualization best practice for that type of data. Um, so first off, the first question that we might ask is, which types of org units actually enroll clients, and then where are they followed up? So in this faceted grid of different charts, um, on the top axis, you can see uh, the event organization unit types, and on the right, you can see where they're enrolled. So really here is where a lot of the um, action happens. It's um, the, the event happens at the unit and the enrollment happens at the org unit. Um, and then here we can see the different uh, colors to represent if this is a first event or a follow-up event. Um, and you see that there's really not a lot of crossover between the different org units, this uh, green section here. In fact, just 8% of all the events after enrollment occurred at a different organization unit than where they were initially enrolled. So while we had developed a system that allowed for sharing of this health uh, data across different clinics, we actually didn't see that that was uh, the case in the vast majority of cases. Um, so, uh, if we actually zero in on these 8% of events that occurred at different org units, um, we can see that, um, sorry, someone's, uh, there's a lot of background noise. Someone can mute, please. Um, thanks. So, if we actually zero in on these, uh, on these uh, org units and events where there was a, um, uh, that were at a different location than the enrollment, 
uh, we can see that the, the majority of these are actually um, moving from the enrollment at a FWA unit and then migrating to a family welfare center. And so if we uh, merge the enrollment and event data uh, outside of DHIS2, that's the type of insight that might be available. Um, one thing that I would like to um, explore a bit more would be uh, about using time as a variable with uh, different animations as well. Um, so in the, uh, so one way that we could do this would be a uh, cascade animation where each dot represents a uh, unique client and you can actually see the flow of data, uh, flow of patients through the health system. So here we can actually see that, um, uh, actually get a sense that this is a health system with flows of clients between the different levels. And maybe that there are other ways that we can do this and start talking about how we can represent these data. Um, but it's not just for getting a sense of the overall health system, but we could also do some uh, basic outlier analysis as well and try and find certain cases where um, individuals might be bouncing between different org units. And maybe there are good reasons for doing that that we can look into a bit more. So if we take some of these pathway generated data outside of DHIS2, that's one thing that we might be able to do. Let's see, I think I have another slide here that it seems to be skipping over. Um, but it's okay, I can move directly into the, um, the final slides. So for the, uh, our insights for the um, uh, MOTLAB context, uh, first I would say that uh, we've seen that most of these clients actually stay within the same organization unit at community or client levels, but few of them get past their third visit. Um, and so there are a variety of reasons that we can think about why that might be the case. So is that because there's a leakage to private facilities? Are they simply discontinuing their uh, service? Um, and so that's something that's worth investigating that these types of analyses can offer. For those that do cross over, most of the events actually happen right around when we would want them to see a clinician, which is at 18 to 22 weeks gestational age. Um, so that's a positive thing. But maybe we can dig a bit deeper into the different uh, gain and loss org units that we see here and understand why that's happening. Is that related to uh, clinic quality? Uh, maybe some clinics aren't performing that well. Or is it just that there's a strong referral system linking different clinics that we're unaware of? Um, and finally, this is, a, this is a step that I would like to uh, discuss a bit more with the DHS2 developers if there's time. Um, but after we get some feedback from the MOTLAB team and see like which ones uh, they really prefer, and we classify them based on like best, best practice principles of visual encoding, um, what, what would be the next step for how we would want to visualize these crossover events in, uh, in DHIS2? Um, because as a uh, tracker really takes off and is the common register for many different health systems, we really need to start looking at how we can uh, best use these um, crossover event data uh, to understand how clients move through the health system. Um, so maybe there's something worth exploring here that we can take into future discussion. Um, I think I had another slide after this, um, more slide as well. And we can talk a bit more maybe after break or in questions to go into other interactive visualizations that we've also done as well. But um, that's all I had for now, thanks. Thank you, Brian. Really interesting visualizations there. I have a question for you as well, which I've posted in the community of practice. Uh, but before that, I think we move on to our third and final presenter for the session. Uh, the last presenter is uh, Pravin Katka from uh, Nepal. He is working as a monitoring and evaluation officer in a non-profit organization called Family Planning Association of Nepal. Today, he'll present his work on the integration of a clinic management information system with DHIS2. Please. Prabin, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, hope you hear me now, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much, Mayima. You know, just uh, and I also like to thank to the organizer for giving this platform to share our experiences 
and thanks to all my you know previous presenter they have really comprehensive you know presentation though i don't have that much comprehensive uh, you know the presentation but it's more about like a, our experiences what you have done by integration uh, between the uh, dhis and cmi so my presentation is more on my experience sharing of our organizations yeah it's a, like integration between the uh, cmis so we call it clinic management inform system and with dhis2 that has really improved uh, in data management in family plan issues in Nepal. Uh, so first, I would like to talk about the background of my organization. EPAN is like established in 1959. It is one of the oldest organizations in Nepal. So it is working for the reproductive health rights, sexual reproductive health and rights. Uh, so later on, it gets like a, a member association of IPPF, which is called International Plant Parent Federations in 1969. So we cover around like a 34 districts out of 77 districts in Nepal. So it's a big organization working in Nepal. And we have 22 family health clinics uh, and 56 uh, community clinics and 151 mobile teams uh, with 68 associated clinics. We also have a network of 349 reproductive health volunteers who distribute all those family planning contraceptives in the community. And we have like 255 active peer-educators working to aware all the sessions among the youth people. Yeah. So this is how we integrate because we've been using the two systems simultaneously. That's like in the left hand side, you can see the open EMR, we call it uh, CMS, Clinical Management Information System, and that has been integrated to the DHIS2, which is uh, local DHIS2. Uh, so you can see that screen on the left hand side of your screen. So before that, you know, I just want to give us some backgrounds, you know, about like uh, the journey of FPAN, you know, before they you know like a uh, FPAN, you know, working before having this kind of systems uh, until 2007, we only had a fully paper-based system. And believe me, that makes the, our job, especially job for our service provider, very tedious. And it's very hard for them to generate the reports, to compile all those uh, uh, data and generate the reports. In 2008, we introduced manual CMS, which is called um, client card also. And also implemented ECMS in we started from the 10 family health clinics. Actually, family health clinics here, is, here it means doctor based clinics, and CC means it's a staff based community clinic. And then we scale up to the 26 clinics by 2018. How till 2016, we were continuously using Excel sheets for reporting of remaining STPs. In 2007, we roll out a local level DHIS2 in all our STVs, and after a short while of having both DHS2 and ECMS and clinics, we arrive at the bridges and we understand like a, uh, taking the system simultaneously with parallel, uh, it makes our life very difficult for the service providers. So we decided to integrate it and to make our jobs more effective and I mean, easy and make our data more data uh, decent, data driven decision making process. So then Actually, for the people who really are not uh, aware with DHS2, I just give a little bit, you know, like uh, silent features of DHS, DHS2 and the CMS. Actually, DHS2 is more automated application tools for collection, validation, analysis, and print presentation of aggregate data. And it's a, like open source flexible data warehouse, which serves as a repository to take data from multiple sources. That is the silent feature of DHS2, whereas the CMS is more uh, it's a client-focused clinical managed system. So like we enter the uh, data of each and every clients in the system. It's a, like a client flow and it, it, it generates the report also, but it's totally, it's a, it's a client-based checking system. It's called CBR. So these things, because we're, uh, we are like kind of running uh, simultaneously, it makes it a little bit difficult for us to get to gen the reports, you know, in, at, at once. So that's why, why we thought like a, why we integrate the system these two system because it has like a, because there are lots of duplication of reports because people our service provider has to fill up uh, many registers you know like and the duplication reports is going on and there there is always a chance of inconsistency in service data and there's a lot of chances of data errors and it has also make like reporting delay in reporting and then there's no option for collection of reports of different clinics and or centralized data 
it's a very difficult for reporting it's so we need to report to the government organization they have their the specific you know the stellar uh, format so we need to fill up that makes uh, quite uh, tedious for us to uh, generate the reports akin to the you know like a standard format given by the government so then we start like a kind of bridging the system so actually what we did you know like we use the you know like ECMS to export the file because you can see there are like a three ECMI systems going on in different you know STPs uh, service delivery points so from there we export the data it's a client based you know like it's a total individual client's data it's been uh, exported uh, to the you know csv file and then that has been imported to the dhs local dhs2 this is at one level in the local uh, level dhs2 and then this other level like a uh, like a kind of integration between between the local dhs to the global dhs because we have to report to our you know like region office and to our central office which is in london so you can see here the screens like of like of two different countries, like one is from like our country, Nepal, and one is from like India. So generally the data we enter in our local DHS2 has been exported and that has been imported to the global DHS2. Generally we'll be doing this for the like a yearly, uh, all those data has been imported to the global DHS2 in the yearly basis. But in our context, in the context of Nepal, we've been doing, we've been generating reports we, in, in, a, in a monthly basis. So though the DHS had the options of doing it weekly basis also, but as per our requirements, we've been uh, doing in a, in a monthly basis. And the main thing, you know, like uh, the benefits, the results, what you get by integration, the system, these two systems, CMS and DHS2, it has made service provider uh, more time to provide more services to the clients because they're most of like their 50% uh, you know, like a pressures of like uh, entering all those, you know, register, manual register has been reduced so that their uh, spare time, they can provide the service to the clients. So it's very good for, uh, for, for the organization. It has also reduced the cost because it's like a one-time uh, investment. And then after that, it's like ongoing process. So it has also reduced the cost also. And then it's a single source information, everything, every, you know, like reports you can generate uh, from the DHS2. So it's a, a very single source of information you can generate it from it. So this is also very benefited for, for the organization like, like Nepal. And uh, so that we can correspond it uh, as per our requirement to the donor or to our, you know, like uh, regions to our, to our central office also. And then it's a significant, it has significantly improved the the data management and analysis and since like the HS2 had like there's lots of options of like a, a data visualizations and then uh, like a infographic systems is there so it makes very easy uh, for us for the data management and for the data analysis thing and it also makes our operation very efficient and no doubt you know like because that's always improve and enhance the data quality also because it has we have to go through different data validation checks also so once we go through it, then uh, data quality, it has increased and enhanced the data quality too. And, 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 and as I already mentioned you that, like it has ease and speed the collection and reporting because otherwise, you know, like a service provider or special managers, they have a hard time like uh, getting all those report compiling and reporting to the, you know, like a, a concerned department. So it takes uh, like a two, three days for them to it just only uh, collect it or uh, just to gather and analyze the you know all this data but now with less than five minutes they can do the job very easily and then generate the reports and it is very transparent also and it's very efficient also and that has also uh, make them to have a like a very effective like data driven decisions in their programs also which is very good for them you know to uh, to 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 be accountable to the donors and to the you know like to the to the, to the government also so it has uh, totally, you know, minimize and reduce the, you know, like duplication of reports, you know, at all levels, you know, from the regional levels to the, you know, like uh, central levels. As, uh, it's, 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 that, that, that's one of the benefits we have uh, getting from the, you know, like because of the integration of the system. And it has also yields in data entry at the time of collision. So that's like a, that is, I, I just saw on it like how the system, the two system when it's integrated, how it, it, it has improved our, you know, like a, uh, the efficiency in working style because it has uh, increased the speed speed of like a service providers, uh, like a, a giving the services. It has uh, reduced the uh, time. It has uh, um, increased the quality because the client, uh, the service providers can give more time to their service uh, to the clients. 
and the client, it has also reduced the waiting time for the clients. So, so it has uh, enhanced the quality uh, of care in, 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 the, in the different service delivery points. And it has reduced the cost also, because I already mentioned you, it's like a one-time you know, like investment and it has reduced all those like uh, printing costs and all those, you know, uh, all, all those uh, extra costs uh, uh, after integration with the system. And then here come like, a, then I've also gathered some of the quotes from the, you know, in users, those, those who are using the system, like integrated system. So as from the service provider, you know, like VO points, uh, like they said that before the integrations, they had many registers and it was difficult and took time. Now we have more time to serve clients, which is uh, the uh, good things for them. And, it, and from the brands and managers, you know, like from the managers level, uh, they said that it has become easier to prepare and generate monthly reports in a short period of time. That is the quotes I have gathered from, from the end users. And it's, uh, though uh, it has also challenges while integrating the system. It's not easy, you know, because uh, there's like a DHS and there's, it has its own system and there's like a, a CMS, it has own system, the service quotes, it's, it's, quite different. I mean, like quotes are quite different. So we need to map icon to the DSS too. So what we did, like we all the services in the CMS has been mapped icon to the local DSS too. And during this like initial time, there's also a lack of appropriate skill because like first time we have been uh, uh, doing this kind of integration. So we have lots of, you know, challenges at the initial time. Uh, and then the, the, there's always a question of training and interaction. This system is new for our service providers and we are uh, at the initial time, they're not so much friendly with, the, with using the computers and, you know, like uh, getting friendly with the system also. So in the in initial time, it was quite challenging for us, but they overcome all the challenges. And it, and generally, you know, like, uh, uh, because the organization like uh, like us, like it's, uh, we are like a non-profit uh, organization. So our budget is, we don't have like a, a substance budgets to invest in the in infrastructures like computers and and others, you know, like uh, logistic support. So uh, during that time, there was also challenges to, uh, to, to, to manage, to arrange all those kind of things because of the lack of financial resources. And our next step, you know, so because there's, as you already mentioned from my, you know, early presenters, there are lots of like options uh, in the modules in the DSS too. So what are, you, what are you planning, you know, like, because we still have these like a CVDs, like our volunteers are still collecting the data in the company label. So those, uh, they are doing it manually. So what do we have tried is like uh, providing the, you know, like mobile to them. And we can uh, argument, uh, we can mitigate that, you know, like data to the, you know, like a data to it uh, through the mobile. So that's like, we're planning to do that thing. And it, we, we are trying to scale up more comprehensive service service delivery data management system itself in the DHS. So still there are some of the you know like services we are not able to uh, tailor especially advocacy thing and all the you know like comprehensive sexual education thing that has been still need to be you know like a map so we're we're doing on that uh, making more comprehensive and also you know like a uh, by the uh, by the uh, by the end of the you know like a 2020 we want to we want to more enhance the a, a data -driv driven decision making cultures that need to be you know like a practice in our organizations uh, so with the help of dhs2 uh, we are looking forward to to improve in that uh, in that part so this is the system what we are using like transformation like they are using in the you know like uh, left hand side it's like a open mr we call it cmis and in the you know right, right hand side those all this data has been uh, exported or imported to the, you know, like uh, DHS2. So this is just one figure, uh, the pictures that I want to show that, you know, before, you know, like using all those manuals, you know, it's more like a service uh, based recurring system. So we have a hard time to start out to retrieve all those data of the clients, you know, so it's, it's, it's really struggling to do that thing. But later now we, we've been using like, it's a, like client based recurring system. So it makes a life more easier for our service provider and to, to the managers. Yeah, that's, that's all, you know, that's like a experience, that's a, uh, that, that's the experience that what you have, you know, like uh, integrating the systems. Thank you, Moima. Yeah, I give it to hand over to the Moima.
Halo. Hey. Hi. I think uh, yeah, maybe I'll unmute it now. Hello. Great. Uh, it's just uh, some difficulty on new thing. Thank you. This last, um, the picture in the last slide, I think it speaks to the, um, the magnitude of difference between the system we had before and what we have now. Um, so I think we have about um, 10 minutes, considering we have to end the session uh, five minutes before uh, four. So uh, please feel free to post your questions on the community of practice. I have a few questions and I think we can start with them now. Uh, so let's just take it to the same order of the presentations um, today. So I have a question to Beatrice. So you had mentioned about making micro plans for each facility. So I was wondering if you could tell us about some of the specific service delivery challenges that health facilities had. Okay, thank you very much, Mahima. Yeah, so some of the health facility challenges that um, were faced at the health facilities were, in some health facilities, um, they didn't have the lab laboratory equipment, so they had to, to take uh, the lab test to other facilities. And they are finding some challenges like uh, transporting the, the lab uh, the lab results from one facility to another. So that sometimes caused uh, delays in, in getting lab results. So because of that, some, some, some of the mothers preferred to go to other facilities which had uh, the full lab equipment. And, um, that, uh, and sometimes the, these facilities were not very close to where they are and uh, that caused some challenges in, in, in uptake. So that is just one example of uh, some of the challenges faced. Others had um, some other challenges like uh, maybe they, they might not be having like the full maternity um, equipment and, and things like that. And sometimes it, uh, we provided some of the facilities with some maternity equipment. And so where we noted that um, uh, the one facility had more equipment than others. We were rotating the, the equipment so that um, uh, the women in other areas uh, within the region can also benefit. So we were looking into those kind of challenges per facility and develop coming up with a plan so that you can be able to, to, to resolve some of the issues that were faced. Interesting, thank you. Still waiting on questions in the community of practice, but I had one for uh, for Brian. Uh, I think you had um, uh, really nice visuals, uh, and I was just wondering about uh, if you could say something about the implementation considerations. How should you implement a system if you were to do these kinds of analysis with uh, tracker data? Yeah, thanks, Mahima. That's a really, uh, that's a really great question. Um, unfortunately, it, it's quite difficult in many contexts because of the um, first the, the upstream technical challenges of uh, making sure that all of the clinicians have access to the clients who may come to their health uh, to their health service out, uh, post. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, if someone is uh, enrolled at a um, very far away in a district, different district, for example. Um, should that uh, clinician have the right to access that health record is mm -hmm. a, a balance between uh, privacy of the record and completeness of the record that you have to strike. Um, secondly, um, identification as well is still quite challenging in many contexts. If you don't have uh, unique identifiers at a national level, then you have to fall back on um, um, incomplete or um, non-ideal um, uh, attributes such as for, uh, na full name and uh, birth date, um, which can be challenging. And then finally, also having um, encouragement and incentives for uh, creating um, a record um, for, sorry, for building on an existing record rather than generating a brand new client. Um, I think for the, um, this idea of searching for a client that exists in a system is still a barrier for many people. They don't quite see the benefits of it. And so we have to design systems that encourage people to do a search, then 
um, up, then create, then um, open the record and then add on rather than skipping that initial search step. Um, so I think uh, there's a combination of those three things. Thank you. I was just typing the question to the last speaker, but um, I can I can read it out as I type. Um, so, uh, Pravin, I think um, I wasn't completely sure if you had mentioned what kinds of data you are including in your system. I think you had a, a brief presentation about it, but then I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the the type of data you collect or the extent of data, what kind of target group that is. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Thank you, Mima. You know, like actually, you know, like uh, since like we are providing the services and reproductive health, you know, all those family planning and all those, uh, all those like uh, like uh, services, you know, related to the sexual reproductive health, you know. So, so we are, you know, like getting all the services, like we are entering all those services, you know. So all those uh, integrated package uh, essential services, you know, all those family planning, you know. The, the, abortions like everything you know like related to sex, sexual reproductive health system so we make a, you know like a clients we make a, like a records of all the systems and you know, all those services in the you know like cms and that all those services are inter i mean integrated i mean uploaded to the dhs too so so it's like a generally all kind of services related to the sexual reproductive health has been you know like a uh, uh, collected so follow -up, a follow-up question to that would be then do you have um, is it set up in such a way that uh, it follows the client so there is um, one client and then all the services are entered together is that how yeah it's yeah it's a like client based recording you know so yeah. like doing in the you know like cms we capture the client based you know the services you know and but like in while uploading it to the you know dhs it's more like aggregated you know like a the, its clients are not inter in that data is too only yeah. the services of those uh, uh, CMS is uploaded in the data is too okay and yeah. the, and the last question I think you'd mentioned um, the resource constraints in terms of uh, finances as one of the important limitations but if yeah. you are to name a technical limitation that you thought was the most um, important or most challenging what would that be yeah, for that, you know, like we're lucky enough, like our, you know, we are the member association of IPO International Planned Parenthood uh, Federation. So technically we've been like a supporting, so we, we get support from there, you know, like we have the experts like working in the region office and working in the central office. We've been getting all the supports from them, but then also it needs like uh, other financial resources for, you know, like getting all those, you know, uh, logistic uh, supports, you know, but so far we, we are getting the, you know, like supports from them. We have like special projects uh, in like the the projects like from Ananos donor has helped or invest a lot for you know like a, uh, for, for 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 setting up all these uh, kind of you know like a, a systems you know but it's still technical support in the local you know like a, in the local context we have lack of those kind of technical sound people in, in the local context you know so because we've been working in the lots of in rural areas you know in different parts of the country it's very mountainous countries because nepal is so we don't have that much technical people uh, like available in, in in that context so that is always a very challenging for us when it, it get crass or when it's like a problem so you know to uh, you know like fix it up you know so it's 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 they have to rely upon the you know like a, in, in the capital cities like a where we are located so in that way you know there's lots of challenges to uh, kind of overcome all those, you know, uh, problems. 